afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Davis, Executive Vice President and Provost at Baylor, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth in a series of symposia to celebrate the inaugural year of our president, Kenneth Winston Starr. Earlier this academic year, our president called us into a period of strategic planning, a time of contemplating how to carry out our grand tradition, pro ecclesia, pro texana, for the church, for the world. As we've begun this symposium series, it's been gratifying to see how the symposia are complementing one another to inform our consideration of these matters. Our first speaker, Ken Elzinga, addressed Christian higher education versus Christians in higher education, speaking directly to Baylor's distinctive mission within the academy. Our second speaker, Jean Bethke Elstein, spoke on the sovereign self in liberal learning warning that the freedom of a, that a liberal education delivers can't save us unless we exercise that freedom in a spirit of love, justice, and in relation to others. Our third speaker, Nancy Cantor, challenged us to consider how we to, are to fulfill pro Texana, speaking from a voice of experience and accomplishment through the scholarship and action strategic focus at Syracuse University. And today's speaker will, no doubt, challenge us as we ponder how our pursuit of our educational mission must engage ethical concerns in the interest of the betterment of humanity. So it is my pleasure to ask Dr. Jeff Levin, University Professor of Epidemiology and Population Health, Professor of Medical Humanities, and Director of the Program on Religion and Population Health at the Institute for the Studies of Religion, to introduce our speaker to you. Well, thank you, Dr. Davis. Uh, it's my great privilege to get to introduce our distinguished visitor, Dr. Baruch A. Brody, who will speak on ethics in the 21st century. Dr. Brody uh, rather distinctively holds three distinguished chairs. I've, I've never heard of that before. I've, I've heard of holding two, and I, I thought one was pretty something, but he's, he's got three. He is the Leon Jaworski Professor of Biomedical Ethics and director of the Center for Medical Ethics and Health Policy at Baylor College of Medicine. He is also the Andrew Mellon Professor of Humanities at Rice University, and he also was appointed Distinguished Service Professor at BCM, the school's highest faculty honor, and was then awarded the Michael E. DeBakey Award for Outstanding Research. He was educated at Mississippi Theological Seminary, at Brooklyn College, and at Princeton, studied at Oxford as a Fulbright Fellow, and began his career on the faculty of MIT. Dr. Brody is author or editor of over 25 books and over 150 articles and chapters. He served on numerous national advisory boards for bioethics and has helped 11 healthcare institutions organize ethics committees. He served for many years as the head of the ethics program at Methodist Hospital at Texas Medical Center in Houston. Dr. Brody has served on the National Board of the American Philosophical Association. He's a past president of the Society for Health and Human Values. He's a fellow of the Hastings Center, and in 2001 was honored with election to the Institute of Medicine. And I should add that a mark of his great stature is that he's merited being the living subject of a Feshrift volume entitled Pluralistic Casuistry, published in 2007, that I am currently reading. Dr. Brody is one of the preeminent bioethicists in the entire world, and we are very honored to have him as our distinguished guest here at the, at the other Baylor, or maybe he's from the other Baylor, I'm not sure. So Dr. Brody, welcome. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I have to tell you, such introductions are actually a bit of a problem, because then you have to give a good talk. You know, it's sort of, <laughs> OK, I'll do what I can to uh, make it. I, I, if I can, let me just take the liberty of saying, I found this to be a very unique invitation. Because usually, when a new president is inaugurated, you know, they have a big party, and uh, I don't know, whatever else they do, that sort of thing. But the thought of having a new president inaugurated in part by having a group of scholars coming to lecture is these days almost unheard of in the academic world. What a remarkably interesting idea and positive idea. So I salute you for having chosen this as the vehicle for inaugurating your president 
and maybe some others will learn to do the same thing. My topic today is going to be ethics in the 21st century. <coughs> My professional life has been devoted to the study of uh, and practice of bioethics, and this talk will really deal primarily with bioethical questions. But as my title suggests, I want to locate the discussion of bioethics within the broader context of ethics in general. There are, as far as I can see, no unique principles of bioethics. There are only bioethical applications of our general moral principles. For that reason, I will begin my discussion of bioethics in the 21st century by considering the developments in ethics in general. Now that might suggest that I believe that there will emerge new ethical principles in the 21st century. That is not what I have in mind. I believe that ethical principles are universally true, that they hold for all people in all places at all times. In other words, I firmly reject any form of ethical relativism. But, as St. Thomas and many others have pointed out, the applications of universal moral principles to ethical dilemmas change as the circumstances change as well. Even a moral universalist like myself can talk about the emergence of a new ethics in the 21st century because we are confronting new problems. Here's what I'm going to do in my talk today. I will say as a side remark, I had a teacher in the fourth grade, and she was trying to teach us how to give talks. And she said to me, Brody, no one's ever going to ask you to give a talk. But just in case they make the mistake of doing so, tell them what you're going to do, do it, and then tell them what you've done. So in honor of this teacher, who was not a very good prognosticator, but actually a very good teacher, let me explain to you what I'm going to be doing in today's talk. <laughs> in the first section, I'm going to introduce three features of the 21st century which will challenge us to think in new ways about ethical questions. And then in the following sections, I will look at the questions that are raised by each of these features and the new ethical thinking that we're going to have to do in connection with those questions. Let me add one final introductory remark. In my talk today, I formulate the principles using, from time to time, theological language. I think that this is probably not going to be a problem when I speak here at Baylor University, although it has been a problem on other occasions. Now, I want to be clear that I think the arguments I'm going to give could be framed in purely secular terms. But I think they lose some of their richness unless they are framed in the theological language that I'm going to be using from time to time. And that's why I do that. But I really do believe that the arguments will hold even if we were thinking in a secular framework. OK, let me begin now with three features that I think are going to be distinguishing the 21st century. Not that they haven't occurred before, but they are occurring in a much more massive sense. The first of these features is globalization. Now, <coughs> what I have in mind by globalization is five things. First, our ability to travel long distance in comparably short periods of time means that straightforwardly we encounter more of the world than we ever did before. And by the way, the rest of the world can travel as well, and so they encounter us. Now, the truth of the matter is that God created only one world, but in the past we could afford to disregard most of it because we were in no contact with them. We can't do that anymore. To just give a simple example that we'll be thinking about when we think of bioethical questions, Think of all the scares there have been in recent years about epidemics and the spread of epidemics that begin in other countries that in the past people didn't even know existed, much less had to worry about the communication of diseases from those countries to us. 
Second feature of globalization is our ability to communicate information from one part of the world to another. It's very difficult today to keep information secret. And what's going on in far-flung countries is something we're all very well aware of. Take as one simple example, uh, the unfettered rapid spread of information through not merely the use of the internet, but Facebook and all these other, I wish I actually knew what Facebook was, but everyone tells me it's another way of doing this. Uh, and think of the implications of what that has done for people who are raising questions in totalitarian societies. Um, third feature of globalization, our ability to easily trade goods and services with other countries. And this means that there has emerged today a truly global economic order in which our economic fates are intertwined with the fates of those who live so far away. Every morning I open the Wall Street Journal to find out what happened to my pension fund in light of the problems of sovereign debt in Europe. I didn't know what sovereign debt meant a few years ago. And why should I care about sovereign debt in Europe? Well, I now have good reasons to care about that. We live in a global economic order. Fourth, our scientific and technological problem, progress is intertwined with progress in the rest of the world. Research and development has become a truly international effort rather than just the effort of a few countries. Well-trained researchers are now spread throughout the world, and collaborations with researchers in other parts of the world take place every day. That's indeed one of the reasons why the internet is so important. It's how I deal with my colleagues and interact with them. And my colleagues are all over. So that's a fourth feature of globalization. And finally, all of these features give rise to another very important and perhaps even deeper phenomena. These other parts of the world with which we are now in such close interaction with have cultures and societies that are based upon very different perspectives and very different values. And we are challenged uh, to understand and appropriately respect these other cultures and their values while trying to be faithful to our own principles. And in many ways, as we shall see when I turn to the bioethical issues, that's the heart of the ethical issue raised by globalization. Fidelity to our own principles as we are aware of and want to respect cultures and traditions that we are now in close interrelationship with, but are very different than ours. In short, God created only one world. For most of human history, people living in one part of that world could disregard people living in other parts of the world. We were often weren't even aware they existed. Now this has changed. With the change occurring at a heightened pace in this century, we have to share God's single world with others who are equally his children. And the first of our great challenges is how to apply our fundamental ethical principles in such a large and more diverse world. Second features that I want to identify is a fundamental change in the types of scientific and technological advances that we are experiencing. Those of us who lived through much of the 20th century are well aware of the massive scientific and technological advances of that century. But I believe that we're now looking to even more fundamental changes, let me briefly identify what these new topics and what these new changes are, and then we'll look in a while at what their ethical challenges are. First, new scientific advances are increasingly growing out of a fuller understanding of our genetic composition. The fundamental knowledge made possible by the sequencing of the human genome uh, <coughs> Uh, has laid the foundation for a new medicine based upon a scientific understanding of the genetic foundation of human traits 
and human diseases. We will soon be in a position to develop a personalized medicine, a medicine which treats your particular uh, version of common diseases with treatments which are likely to be more efficacious for you. Uh, some time ago, with the previous iteration of Baylor College of Medicine under a previous president, we announced we want personalized medicine. That was a bit of hubris on our part, but you know, we had a, anyway, we won't go further on that point. <laughs> uh, but that's coming, and that's coming in spades. In addition, we are also increasingly able to identify those individuals whose genetic makeup makes them more susceptible to particular diseases so that we can identify early disease and provide treatments that prevent or at least slow the progression of these diseases. This is a new type of power based upon a fundamental understanding of our genetic nature and of the genetic nature of diseases, and it will give rise to many ethical questions, as I will explain shortly. Secondly, until now, dealing with the limitations of functioning, which are the aftermath of disease, has been primarily a matter of medicines that aid functioning, rehabilitation that strengthens re residual functioning, and artificial prostheses. Presses, cardiac rehabilitation, and LVADs are examples of this approach to restoring cardiac functioning. Regenerative medicine introduces us to an entirely new approach to these issues. Regenerative medicine is an attempt to use natural biological processes to restore functioning by replacing uh, damaged tissue. If a heart attack has left you with uh, reduced cardiac functioning because of damaged myocardium, that functioning may be able to be restored if we can program progenitor cells to produce new uh, cardiac tissue. This, of course, involves the question of stem cells, and I will come back and talk some more about that question in a short while. Now, those first two, regenerative medicine and uh, genetic the base medicine are what people think a lot about when they think about what the 21st century is going to be like. But there is a third thing that we need to be thinking about. One of the great goals in medicine is the ability to identify the onset of disease at the very earliest stages, perhaps only when a few cells are involved. Just imagine if we could identify who has developed cancer when that's only 10 or 15 cells? What are the therapeutic possibilities that that gives rise to? Now, this is not an easy matter to do. And nanotechnology, the technology of using immensely small materials, offers us the hope of being able to identify such sensors <coughs> that could be entered into the body and could search for these earliest disease cells. I was working for a while as a consultant to NASA. NASA was very interested in this question when they were thinking of long-term spaceflight. Because what happens if someone got very sick six months into a three-year mission? Well, what they wanted was some way of telling when that person had 10 cells that were sick. Then they might be able to deal with it with the limited equipment that they had available. So NASA was investing very heavily in nanosensors, which continues to remain an important element of functioning. Will any of these things succeed? I don't know. Truth of the matter is I've lived through the years of gene transfer therapy that we all believed in and haven't really been such a great success. So I don't know whether any of these things work, but the search for them is going to shape the 21st century and I will want to be talking about the ethical issues associated with that search. The third of the features that I wish to identify is the recognition of human limitation and of inevitable finitude, which I think the 21st century is going to have to grapple with. Religious people have always understood that infinitude is a feature only of God. Everything else is finite, and this finitude imposes limitations. 
That's why in some sense, hubris, even though it's a Greek term, is one of the most fundamental of the theological sins. We confuse ourselves and our limited capacities with God and his infinite capacities. I believe that the 21st century is going to be the century in which this message that the religious traditions have always taught is going to become extremely prominent as all of us will have to confront the idea of human finitude. Let me give you three final examples and then we will turn to the ethical issues. Remember, we're looking at the features of the 21st century first. One, one of the most important drivers of this recognition will be the emergence of demands from rapidly developing countries like India and China with large populations. As the income of these populations grow, they become competitors for so many of the resources whose abundant use is central to our own prosperity. Have you looked at the price of gasoline this week? Remember, it's going to be $4 in the near future. And a good part of the reason for that is because there are all these people in China and India who now have cars. And they also think they should be able to drive. What a strange presumption. No, anyway. So <laughs> this is a matter of finitude. We had it. Now they want their share of it. That means what? That means we have less. So that's no doubt more commodities can be discovered, but there are limitations to these possibilities. And it will challenge us to develop new approaches to meaning as we come to recognize that we cannot count on what we have counted upon in the past. I'm sorry, that may sound to younger people really quite pessimistic. And, uh, that's what it's supposed to sound. Uh, I, got, I got to stick to the text. And kind of, OK. You know, as you can all see, I've made a reputation as being a very formal lecturer. So. <laughs> Two, there are other examples in which a sense of absolute finitude will increasingly develop. These are cases where we will face limitations that are not due to other people, that they're simply due to the nature of the situation. Perhaps the most pressing examples relate to fundamental commodities, such as clean air and clean water. Those who have emphasized the phenomenon of sustainable development have seen those issues emerging for some time. They are going to be more clearly emerging as the years go forward. And this is not a question of global warming, yes or no. It's just a question of clean water and clean air. I want to avoid, if we can, this afternoon, that topic. Finally, on this matter of limitations, there is the question of the limitations on healthy and satisfactory longevity. The 20th century was marked by a tremendous expansion in life expectancy throughout the world. Moreover, developments in medicine have led to more people leaving those extra, living those extra years in better health and increased functioning, even though there are still lots of people who come to old age living with great debilitation. How far can this extension continue? Is there some limit? No one knows the answer to these questions. But there is a larger issue here about longevity that we need to confront. How do we find meaningfulness in those extra years? All of us who are getting closer to the age of retirement yearn for increased freedom. But we also wonder, what are we going to do? What are we going to do that will give these extra years full meaning. There is a famous philosophical essay called The Tedium of Immortality. It raises an interesting question. What do you do to keep yourself busy in an immortal life? Uh, think of the Frangelico painting where all the angels are looking at God. Sounds great for the first million years. What do you do? So that's the question of the tedium, which has to be thought about. Uh, that, by the way, was meant to be a serious theological remark. Unfortunately, it always becomes a joke. For many, the fear is that the tedium of those last 20 years of life, can we offer a more expansive understanding of meaningful and fulfilling life to those who will be living for longer years? 
So those are my three major developments. Globalization, new transformative science, and the sense of finitude and limitation. What I want to do now is turn to some of the bioethical issues that are raised by globalization. I'm going to use a series of examples uh, to identify these issues. <coughs> My first <coughs> example has to do with pharmaceuticals. One of the crucial features of medicine as it developed in the second half of the 20th century was its heavy reliance on medications. We take for granted that there will be medicines for treating infections, heart fail, diabetes, cancer, Alzheimer's, anything else you've got on your list. We hope that there will be even more in the future. There are few in this room who can remember, and I'm not one of them, who can remember the period before World War II when there were very few efficacious medicines. Before the antibiotics begin to emerge in the late 1930s, the one or more than 10 to 12 drugs that any doctor would consider using today. Most of the rest were just worthless, if not dangerous. So we're used to that now. None of this happens effortlessly. New drugs that might work have to be identified and rigorously tested and finally approved after a lengthy review process. The process of research and development is very expensive. It has been estimated that cost an average of $800 million to bring a new drug to market. I actually don't believe that number. Cut it in half and it's still a lot of dollars. You know, 400 million, I don't know what it's like, I don't know what the endowment is here, or, but 400 million sounds like a goodly number, right? So someone has to provide that money. Those who invest to support the process of research and development expect and are entitled to a financial reward. Uh, that reward is granted by patents, which give them an exclusive right to produce and sell the newly approved drug for a limited period of time. Acceptance of this system is based on a capitalistic ethic which supports incentives to invest and rewards for successful investment. Some just see this as an economic reality. I see it as an expression of a social philosophy and a social ethics which is foundational to sciences based upon market economies, a social philosophy and ethics which I support. But there is, of course, another side to this story, and that's where globalization raises the problems. The whole point of developing these new pharmaceuticals is to make better treatments available to those who are in need of them. Some justify this claim by reference to right to health care. I think it's really much more important to justify that claim by the notion of uh, our providing these medications as a compassionate response based upon recognizing that all of us are equally created in God's image. So this other side of the story is also rooted in the fundamental moral philosophy and social ethics. And the question of how to provide incentives while still enabling access has become an increasing problem in recent years, and globalization has made that problem worse. Why? Our global system of communicating information has made us very aware of how many people are in need of these pharmaceuticals in other parts of the world. This message was made very clear through the crisis of how to make antiretroviral drugs available to those who are HIV positive, suffering in very poor countries. The call of compassion has been met by the Global Fund as an international response, and PEPFAR, that's the president's program, as a United States response. They have made a great deal of money available for purchasing and supplying these drugs. And all of this is highly commendable. But the majority of those in need of the drugs throughout the world are still not receiving them. Some would say that this means we just have to spend a lot more money. You know, we'll spend three times as much money. Probably people aren't saying that as much this month. But this neglects the importance of a sense of finitude. There are many needs, and how should this be prioritized? How do we apply our commitments 
to capitalistic incentives and to compassionate care for those in the global community when we are well aware of our limitations to provide all that could be helpful. While this issue has been widely discussed, I think there is another issue related to globalization and pharmaceuticals that deserves more attention. Another aspect of globalization is the emergence of a truly global economic order. Pharmaceutical manufacturers are international enterprises selling their products throughout the world. It is easy to adopt the stance that they should sell their pharmaceuticals at very low prices to very poor countries. It is also easy to adopt the stance that their return on investments must come primarily for sales in the affluent countries that can cover the course. But how should these pharmaceuticals be priced in rapidly developing countries, in Brazil, in Thailand, in China? When is it time for them to start bearing their share of the course rather than leaving it all on the developed countries? And while it's not in the text, I'll add, when is the time for Europe to start bearing its share of the cost of research and development rather than leaving it all on the United States, the only country which doesn't have price limitations on pharmaceuticals? So there are major questions here about justice and fairness, both in who's going to get these medications and also in who's going to pay for the research and development and these are not just questions about the United States anymore. These are questions about the global economy and the global scientific order. So that's my first example. My second example of the impact of globalization has to do with conducting research and using its results in morally controversial areas. I'll use as my example stem cell research and the development of regenerative medicine. As the potential for regenerative medicine using embryonic stem cells and other progenitor cells emerged at the end of the 20th century, two debates broke out in the United States. The first debate centered on the morality of it research. Was it inherently evil? Did it make a difference whether the research was conducted on spare embryos from reproductive medicine clinics that would otherwise be destroyed? You've all heard that discussion, and many more such questions could give rise. The second debate centered on issues of moral pluralism. How should a social policy be structured for a society in which people disagree at much such a fundamental level about the morality of this research? Should the research be supported only by private funds without the use of any public funds? Should the research be allowed at all? Should these questions be answered differently in different states, given the variability in cultural differences among states and given the American commitment to federalism? We're all familiar about this question and about the very different stance taken on this question by President Bush and by President Obama. But I will not say anything more about these debates. I want to raise a question about how globalization impacts upon these debates. One of the questions that I want to raise is about the implications of the fact that the research is going to be done anyway, if not in the United States, in other countries whose ethic and culture is very different. Given this fact, Many have argued that it is wrong to put the United States behind these other countries, both scientifically and economically. If, of course, other progenitor cells turn out to be as good as embryonic cells, it's not a problem. But if embryonic cells turn out to be superior, then the loss to the United States will be much greater. In short, these people argue that a restrictive United States policy accomplishes nothing except disadvantaging the United States from both a scientific and a commercial perspective. Others don't see it this way. They believe that the strong embryonic stem cell is inherently immoral, and why should we uh, fund or even allow such research just because others are doing it? 
And if we lose some benefits by adhering to our moral principles, we also gain by adhering to our moral principles. The globalization of this issue has brought even greater complexity to the question of moral pluralism. We all support the principle that people should not violate the dictates of their conscience. We all support the principle that we must expect, accept and respect the reality of moral pluralism. This is why there is a certain traction to the view that we uh, allow but don't publicly fund such research. All I'm claiming is that these whole questions get to be transformed when we have to ask the question of the United States versus the rest of the world in this area. The question of developing social policies, pluralistic societies, is a notoriously complex issue which predates any issue of globalization. What I have suggested is that globalization complicates things further because it raises issues of global competitiveness and of global injustices. The 21st century will have to deal with these additional questions. But before I leave the impact of globalization, I ask you to remember that this does not mean that we need new moral principles. What it does mean is the application of our principles is going to be more complex and more nuanced as a result of globalization. Let me turn now to the second, and that's this question of the radically new types of science. There are many, new, many examples of new bioethical issues raised by these new uh, scientific development. What I want to focus is on only one set, and that's the question of having more accurate predictive knowledge about our own health-related futures. And I want to use as my example the genetics of breast cancer. All women are at risk for breast cancer, 12% of the women sitting in this room or any other room will develop breast cancer during their lifetime. I'm not a prophet. It's just the way the numbers work. It's, I just want to be clear. I make a lot of claims for myself. That's not one of them. It wasn't in the introduction, I don't think, either. OK. So I'm just reporting a statistical fact about the incidence of breast cancer. But only 2% of these women have a serious family history of breast cancer. So most breast cancers develop in women without a serious family history. But with the discovery of two new genetic mutations, BRCA1 and BRCA2, the whole nature of prediction began to change. Most, depending upon which series you look at, 60 to 80% of women with one of those mutations uh, will develop breast cancer during their lifetime and some that don't develop breast cancer will develop ovarian cancer. As a result, women in high-risk populations are being tested for these mutations, and many of those who test positively for those mutations have begun taking medicines prophylactically, and even more extremely, some of them have undergone mastectomies and oophrectomies prophylactically to lessen their risk. This general pattern is going to be repeated more and more in the 21st century as the genetic basis of disease becomes more and more well known. Uh, so what are the ethical issues that are raised? First, some for the patient. As long as there were no effective ways of slowing the onset of disease and of treating it when it developed, the question of being tested to see if you are at risk is really a matter of personal uh, feelings. Consider the case of Huntington's Korea. And uh, some of you, uh, Arlo Guthrie and Woody, Guthrie, Woody had, Arlo does not. If you have the wrong genes, you will develop this disease. That's not a 25% or a 50% prediction. That's a 100% prediction. And there is nothing that can be done about that disease at this time. For those of you who don't know the disease, it's an extremely, the onset is usually in the 40s, extremely debilitating disease, both physically and mentally. Uh, it's a really bad way to die. Since the disease manifests itself in the middle of one's life, unless one is tested genetically, 
one will not know whether we're going to develop the disease. And that becomes an important question as you think, for example, about reproduction. Some people who are at risk because of a family history prefer not to know, concerned that the knowledge will emotionally cloud one's life in the earlier healthy years. Others prefer to know, thinking that this can help them plan how to use the good time that they have left. But the contrast that with the genetics of breast cancer and the many other examples coming down the road. Moreover, and now we get to the deep ethical question, suppose one believes that people have a moral responsibility to care for their bodies and for their health. Religious people express this theme as the idea that we are only God's steward over our bodies and stewards are supposed to take care of that which they are stewards of over. Secondly, we can also treat this as an obligation that is part of the obligation of respecting human dignity. What are our moral obligations to test ourselves for disease susceptibility? How far are we obliged to adopt measures to prevent or delay the onset of disease? Or is this just a matter of personal choice, like the taste of Huntington's career? So that type of pattern and that type of issue from the patient's perspective is going to become more important in the years that uh, are coming forward. When we start having some treatment to Alzheimer's, we have a very good genetic test for knowing the likelihood of your developing Alzheimer's, not, a, not like Huntington's Korea. Uh, do you want to know whether you're likely to develop Alzheimer's? And should you want to know? So as treatments become available, you will go to earlier screening and earlier treatment. No one thought about that question in the past because there was no way to know. There is actually, and some of you actually may, that information may be in your own medical records. It's in mine. I don't know what, the end, what it says because it's also predictive of cardiovascular disease. And my internist, gets that genetic test for all of his patients who agree so he knows how vigorously he should treat cardiovascular condition. So he knows whether I'm at high risk for developing Alzheimer's. He's also a good friend, but he's been very careful not to let me know. Uh, the interesting question about is what he's going to do when I say, you know, you have the information, it's my information, tell me. Uh, we haven't gotten to that stage yet. OK, so that's a new set of questions about what are our responsibilities to find out information and to be treated. And those type of questions are going to emerge very, very heavily in the, tw in the 21st century. But now I want to talk about it not from the perspective of doctors, uh, for patients. I want to talk about it from the perspective of doctors. Providers should not and usually cannot force their patients to make particular health care decisions. But they certainly can encourage their patients to make those decisions which are good for their health. That is a fundamental part of the physician's obligation of fidelity to the interests of uh, the patient. We expect good doctors to encourage patients who are smoking to stop smoking and so forth. Recent research has identified the extensive ways in which more than encouragement takes place. The way we structure the choice decision, the way we present information, and the system of defaults we adopt have, uh, have great influence on the decisions that patients make. This realization has said to, led to a series of fascinating new moral questions. How much should we limit or exploit these phenomena in dealing with these decisions? Consider the physician who is discussing genetic screening for breast cancer susceptibility with patients who have serious family histories. Should the physician treat such screening as that which is to be done unless the patient objects? So you have to opt out of the screening, otherwise you're getting it. Should the physician treat such screening as something which is done only if the patient requests it. You have to opt in. That's a very big difference, because mostly 
the default is what we do. So opting out versus opting out. Well, what should physicians think about screening for breast cancer? These questions have always been present in the patient-physician relationship, but the developments in science and medicine in the 21st century are going to make them more pressing. To summarize the proliferation in the 21st century of genetic information related to disease susceptibility is going to lead to a rethinking of such traditional moral beliefs as stewardship over one's body, fidelity to the interest of patients, freedom in the flow of information, and legitimate social paternalism. Once more, our moral principles will not lose their validity, but our understanding of them and our application of them will be more nuanced as we apply them to the complexities of genetic information that will be available in this century. I turn now to the last part of my talk, which is going to talk about the ethical and bioethical implications of the increasing uh, recognition of human limitations of an inevitable finitude. I begin my discussion by reflecting on the delivery of healthcare in the United States. The United States has been the leader in scientific research and its applications to medical practice and new technology. But the use of these new medical discoveries is one of the major drivers of increased healthcare expenditures. Uh, I guess an example should be given to illustrate that point. Uh, I spent many years serving as one of the members of the NIH's committee that reviewed all AIDS research funded by the NIH in the United States. Uh, and it used to be AIDS patients were not expensive because they got sick and they died. Then what happened? These doctors and these researchers did this terrible thing. They discovered all these treatments. And guess what happens? These patients live. I know you all think that's a good idea. It is a good idea. But that isn't for free. That's the sort of pattern you have to keep in mind. New medical advances almost always carry with them greater medical expenditures. And new technology is the largest driver of the increase in healthcare costs. Now, it wasn't long ago that we only spent 10% of the gross domestic product on health care. This year, we almost hit 18%. And 20% seems likely within the next dis not too distant future. And a good deal of this is due to the adoption of expensive new technology. <coughs> so we're caught up in a dilemma. And the dilemma is, on the one hand, we value human life and we want to see its prolongation and its improvement, and that costs money. And on the other hand, we have a sense of finitude. We don't have an infinite pool of resources. Allow me to digress, to digress. Allow me to digress for a moment, it's been a long day, to pay tribute to Cardinal Bernardine, whose concept of the consistent ethics of life has greatly influenced my thinking. Addressing himself to a pro-life community, he called upon them to be consistent in their commitment to the preservation of human life. That means not only protecting the life of those unborn, but also protecting the life of those already born whose lives are threatened by disease. It is this seamless value which has driven our commitment to the expansion of treatments which we provide to all in need of them. And of course, the Cardinal's point was, don't say you believe in the value of life if all you believe in is the value of unborn life. It is this fundamental value that needs to be nuanced by our recognition of human limitation and finitude. <coughs> it is not a question of economics. It's a question of the balancing of values when we think about what are the resources available to us. Money that is spent on one good thing is not available to spend on other good things. Even if we think of extending human life, healthcare is not the only thing of value. 
And once we add the value of enhancing human life, still we have more good opportunities to spend our money. Uh, I was talking to the president before, give the faculty a large additional amount. They'll find ways, good ways, to spend every last penny. And the same, that was only meant for the faculty members. <laughs> the same is true for our society as we think of good medical treatments. I assure you my colleagues at the medical school have all types of splendid ideas of how to treat you if only somebody will pay for it. This, of course, is not a problem that we face uniquely in the United States. All countries face it to a greater or lesser degree. <coughs> uh, for example, there was a time in the United Kingdom which denied dialysis to those over 55. And it has in place today mechanisms to limit the use of expensive drugs that provide only modest extensions of life. These are sorts of examples that raise concern about death panels. My concern is with the nature of the process. What we need is not a process that fo focuses solely on how to best spend our healthcare dollars. What we need instead is a far broader process based on a democratic dialogue about our values and how to prioritize them. This leads us to a very different and ethical challenge, the question of how to design such a dialogue in our society and how to implement its results. As we reflect on this question, there is one crucial threshold point that must be kept in mind. Much of the prioritizing is about how individuals prioritize uh, their own values as they decide how to spend their limited final resources. But that's only at the individual level. At the social level, the question becomes, how do we prioritize among the goods that we as a society are prepared to pay for? And that's not a question that we have been good at thinking about, because once more, we have had too much hubris about our capacities to do everything that is good. Now. I hope that no one is expecting that I will now announce the answer to this question. <laughs> I needed a joke at this point. When I was younger, I actually envisaged developing a theory of prioritization of values in a democratic society. This next remark is addressed to the students and not the faculty. Young people are entitled to grandiose goals. But that becomes presumptuous and just foolish in more mature people. I think that we need to give up the hope that we can develop a universally valid answer to these questions, but we might hope to develop a reasonable and ethically acceptable process for answering uh, them at a given time. Let me be clear about what I've been claiming. The preciousness of human life remains as valid a value as it has always been. And that's why I wanted to once more reaffirm the importance of Cardinal Bernardine's remark. But there are, of course, other important legitimate values. In the latter part of the 20th century, many affluent countries, especially the United States, operated on the seductive assumption that we could have it all, disregarding the finitude of the human condition. This was an act of theological hubris. The growing percentage of the gross domestic product devoted to health care due in a significant degree to a desire to extend precious human life should now be bringing us to a reminder of our limitations and our finitude. Once more, this is not a call to change our values. It is called to adopt a more nuanced understanding of our values in a world in which prioritization is seen as a necessary consequence of human finitude. So now, remember my teacher? I told you what I was going to do. I did it. Now the conclusion, which I will tell you what I have done. So those who are sleeping can now wake up <laughs> and get some notes down in their book. Conclusion. I need a moment to rest. After. OK. <laughs> there are many fundamental values and moral principles involved in the ethical and bioethical principles I have discussed. Some of these include compassion in meeting the needs of others, respect for the preciousness of human life, 
recognition of the inherent finitude of human beings, respect for the need to accommodate moral pluralism, fairness in the distribution of joint burdens, belief in the legitimate rewards of capitalistic investment, obligations of stewardship over our body, and fidelity to the interests of those with whom we stand in special relations. None of these are new values. I believe that they are universally valid principles and values that have long been recognized by people who are sensitive to the truth of morality. I have not claimed that globalization, new types of scientific advances, and the increased recognition of human finitude will challenge the legitimacy of these values. I firmly believe that they are as legitimate today as they have always been. What I have claimed is that we will need to develop a new, more nuanced understanding of these values and how they interact with each other in changed circumstances if we are to meet the ethical challenges of the 21st century. Thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you for uh, the challenge that you put before us, the comfort that the morals and values that we have are not changing, but we must be educated and understand these new challenges for the 21st century. So let's have a few questions. Since he's not going to provide us the answers, right, it'd be helpful if he'd give us the end, but let's at least take advantage of this thinking that far surpasses what I suspect most of us have done so far. Yeah. Professor Brody, thank you so much for a terrific talk and um, a really nice exposition of various challenges uh, in the 21st century with respect to bioethics. Um, one notion, moral notion or value, is, is a commitment to human dignity. And um, there are various accounts of what human dignity implies. Uh, some think it's uh, a vacuous term. Some think that it's a placeholder for autonomy. Others in the uh, Judeo-Christian tradition think it implies being uh, a creation of God, made in the likeness and image of God. Uh, I'd like for you, if you would, just to talk a bit about what you think the, the future of discourse about human dignity is in the 21st century. Lots of people say, you know, this is going to be the way that we ultimately have to ground these universal moral principles and we, we uh, we do best to sort of focus on this question. I do that in 25 words or less. Uh, uh, actually, I think you raised an extremely important question, and let me make a number of observations about that. The first of all is there is a radical difference between bioethical thinking in Europe and in the United States, at least if you exclude some conservative bioethicists in the United States who speak, think much more like the Europeans. In Europe, it is understood that the concept of human dignity is the most fundamental of the moral concepts. Human rights, all types of other things are grounded in human dignity. So that's a view that you find in Europe and you find it in most of the documents of the United Nations in the covenants about various human rights and so forth. You find in the writings of the European Commission, the European Union, that's the standard view. The standard view in the United States bioethics community is the concept of human dignity does no real work. That at the end it has no content and we could do bioethics perfectly well without the use of the concept of human dignity. Now, some people will think that this represents a difference in religious and theological views. And that isn't true for two reasons. Reason number one is Europe at the moment is not a great uh, continent for deep religious and theological views. Europe has become an increasingly secular society. And in fact, when the question arose, when the European Union was trying to develop some of its fundamental principles, should they even make reference to the theological foundations of human dignity, 
and the Judeo-Christian tradition, the European Union refused, despite a very strong protest from the Pope, who insisted, how could you leave out religion from the foundation? So Europe isn't stressing human dignity because of its deep theological beliefs about how we're all created in the image of God. And the other reason why I don't think it's just an issue about religion is that many religious ethicists in the United States think they can do all the work that needs to be done without any reference to human dignity, just to those various principles of the type that I was enunciating. So I don't think that we have here a difference between a religious conception rooted in human dignity and a secular ethics rooted in something else. I think the real question is really a conceptual question. I went through this whole talk without once mentioning the word human dignity. I hope, I, I'm sure that's true, I guess I did a word search, you know, not a word search, you know, a universal search, and I wanted to make sure the word dignity was out, because I figured someone was gonna ask a question like that. <laughs> now, I also went through a talk that was again and again rooted in my religious and theological commitments. So maybe you can do all that you need to do in bioethics without invoking the concept of human dignity. And the question then becomes, and it's a very deep question, what more does the concept of human dignity add to our ethical understanding? When we add respect for human life and respect, you know, after we've done all of that. So I've long wondered what the answer to that question is. And for years, I've been urging my graduate students, one of them, why don't you take on that as a thesis project? That's how professors deal with questions that are very hard. <laughs> let, let them work on it. Maybe they'll get it right. But if they get it wrong, they got it wrong. OK. <laughs> uh, I was about to say, I finally found the sucker. No. Uh, I have this very fine. A uh, graduate student now, who by the way also already has a JD degree, and she comes from a real background in international jurisprudence, as well as in, now in philosophy, and she has taken on just this question, that do we get additional ethical uh, insight? Do we get more bang for our bucks in ethics if we what, if we add the concept of human dignity. And let me just give one or two examples of where she thinks it might make a difference. Okay. <coughs> Consider the question, which you have to be sort of almost a patent lawyer to worry about this question, namely the patenting of the human genome, which has become a very, very big issue for many of the companies that do the fundamental scientific research, the payoff is to be able to patent a particular gene and its association with a disease, and then you have a product, or at least you have information that you can sell to other people. Okay. Now, from the perspective of a capitalistic ethic that I talked about, these people have invested in the research, and they're entitled. And if we don't give them these rewards, why, in a society built upon a capitalist ethics, will they invest? So that's a powerful argument for treating this the same as everything else. There are counter arguments that could be given. The Europeans all think that this is morally hideous. That's not a question of the economics of invention. The Europeans think that this is a fundamental assault on human dignity to allow the patenting of human genes. Okay. And the Americans look at it and say, what in the world are you talking about? <laughs> okay. Now, there are some Americans who are opposed to that, but their arguments are different. You know, if we have too many patents on human genes, one patent interferes with another patent. It's hard to do cross-licensing, all these various economic arguments, but never the word human dignity. So one of the types of questions she's discussing in her thesis is, 
can we fashion a justifiable concept of human dignity that would provide a basis for saying, as the Europeans have, it is morally wrong to allow human genes to be patented, or can we not? And if the answer is yes, then we better have a concept of human dignity in our bioethics. So she's got about a dozen examples of this sort of question. And that's what she's working her way through on her thesis. And with a little bit of luck, she'll be done a year from June. But that's what thesis advisors always say. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you, asked, uh, you opened up a really important set of issues when you uh, raised that question. Please, who's next? I'm, I'm told I'm to call upon people. I tell bad jokes otherwise, so you better ask your question. Please. Oh, hi, Dr. Hey, Dr. Rohde. Um, I have a question when you were talking about the finitude of human life in, in maybe regards to a case like Terry Schiavo's, who was splashed all across the evening news for a long time. Um, what emphasis do you think should be placed on living wills or end of life counseling um, in regards to maybe like younger people like me who like maybe tomorrow I should get into an accident that, Lord forbid, puts me in a reduced state of life, or older people who should um, be expecting to end their lives like, oh, DNR orders and stuff like that. I like when people ask small, simple questions. <laughs> it makes it so much easier. But it was a good question. Um, so look, there are many, many components to that question that needs to be dealt with. Let me put, or let me raise to quickly deal with one of those components. And that has to do with this question of feeding and hydrating uh, permanently unconscious patients. We have a standard view out there, both in the uh, ethical community and the legal community, is you should treat uh, nutrition and hydration no different than any other form of treatment. I have, over the years, argued against that for two very different reasons. Uh, one of them is nobody has been able to show me on the basis of any neurological evidence that at some level, even patients who are as comatose as this individual was don't experience at some criminal level uh, pain and discomfort. And I always worry about that. Because I don't know what you're like, but when I get thirsty, I don't like it. <laughs> and the thirstier I get, OK. You know, in my religious community, we sometimes fast for 24 hours, and we don't eat and we don't drink. The last few hours, you know, so imagine being that way for days, weeks, okay. So I worry about that question. And I also worry about the question of, if you don't feed or hydrate somebody who can't do it on their own, is that a form of killing? Think of the parents that don't feed their children and die. So one part of the debate there had to do with nutrition and hydration. And on that, I have views that are quite different than the mainstream, but I urge you to think about them as serious possibilities. Put that one aside. And then we come to the more fundamental question, which is the extent to which human beings should be given control over their dying. Now, I want to put aside again another question, the question of killing yourself. That raises its own very separate moral issues. Uh, I'm focusing in simply on the question of the extent to which human beings are entitled to say, this form of life I would pass on. Now let me say a couple of things about that, and I'm giving you afraid a long answer, but you asked a complex question. One is, you need to be very careful when you're not in a certain condition to ask yourself, how would you feel about being alive in that condition? If you ask me now, suppose I don't know, on the way home you know, to the hotel, terrible car wreck, and I become a high quad. Brody, do you want to live that way? Here's my quick answer, no. Although I've seen people who are high quads who've made a real life for themselves. This is just the way I feel. Uh, that's how I feel now. 
if God forbid, well, I was in that situation. So you have to, you know, be very careful to think through what instructions you want to give people. Uh, so I think that's one point you need to think about as you craft these advanced directives and living wills. And they usually don't give you the opportunity to make these type of subtle and nuanced types of decisions. So one has to be very careful about that process. Having said that much, I do think it is within the capacity of human beings and the moral authority of human beings to say, at a certain point, I don't want to be treated any further. Actually, I shouldn't say that. I always want to be treated to be kept dignified and comfortable. I actually use the word dignity now. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. I, OK. I, I all, you know what? When you talk about the topics I talk about, you've got to keep a sense of humor, or you can't get through the day. But in any case, I always want to be treated, but I don't want to have my life extended under such a condition. I'll, I'll give you a personal example. I've never been much of an athlete. I've never been, I don't camp. You know, I'm not the physical activity type person. I'm just saying, uh, what should I tell you? I'm really good about uh, turning over in the bed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I do like to think of myself as a person of intellect and a person of mind. That's, when all is said and done, that's what I am. And that may be a good thing, but it just, that's how I am. I don't want to be a person who can't do that sort of thing. And I have a terrible image of one of the great rabbinic figures of the 20th century who spent the last decade of his life as a mumbling idiot. Given that he was a great scholar, he spent the time meaninglessly repeated sacred texts. And his own children found it difficult to be with him, to watch this great mind I don't want to be, I'm, I'm not, I don't have his mind, but I don't want to be that way. So if I get that way and I develop an infection, just give me some, I don't know. Huh? No, 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 no penicillin, no. Just give me, no, no, I want some Tylenol. Infections can be unpleasant, but that's it. But that's Brody making his choice. And that's the type of thing you really need to think about every individual. So again, three things. Nutrition and hydration needs to be thought about differently. The issue of suicide has its own moral complexity that needs to be thought about. And then there needs to be the complex thinking through of every individual of what conditions of life would be acceptable to me. I don't want them, but they're acceptable, and what conditions are not. And in doing that thinking, you got to remember, it's not how you as a 20-year-old or 25, whatever age you are, think about the question. How will you think about that question if you wound up in that situation? And that's a much harder thing to sort out. So I think people should be thinking about these issues and should perhaps write directives. Don't use simple forms. They don't give you the opportunity to really express what your thoughts are. But you got to think long and hard about these issues before you fill out such a document. I hate when they show up in the hospital, they say, do you have a living will? Oh, you thought, would you like one? Yes. Uh, it's required by law. OK, you know, I didn't like the television show this evening, and the food is the usual awful food. Why don't I fill out a living will, you know? <laughs> OK, maybe it never happens as bad as that. But think of what that says about a society, such an important existential discussion handed out between the television policy and the policy about uh, valuable articles. You know, that's not the way you should go about it, please. My question sort of follows along that. I really appreciated your comment about the need for a robust public discussion on some of these topics. But my observation is that historically, we are terrible at robust, meaningful discussions, particularly on scientific and technical issues, until we're in the midst of a disaster. And then it's usually about the short-term solution. So I guess my question to you as a very thoughtful person who spent a long time writing about these issues, 
what can we do to help facilitate a public discussion that will get us where we need to be, whether as universities or as individuals in our communities? How do we do that? Okay. I have one immediate suggestion. You know that pill that raises everybody's IQ by 50 points? Put it into the water immediately. Uh, <laughs> that would help some, I think. <laughs> that was a bad joke, and I apologize. <laughs> but you know, you got to try. <laughs> it's a really deep question that you've asked, and there are a number of components to that. One is, as you called attention, to the fact that we have done a miserable job in science education. People just don't know any science and have no idea what the scientific method is. I teach at one of the very best universities in the country. I'm proud to say that. Our SAT scores are as good as Harvard's. Last, yesterday, I was lecturing on arguments for the existence of God, the cosmological argument, and I wanted to talk about the implications of Big Bang Theory. There were four out of 35 students that had any serious knowledge of this fundamental scientific principle. And there were a bunch more who had, you know, there was a big explosion, and it was all. So I spent 10 or 15. Now, this is, and by the way, a majority of them are science and engineering students. I don't know why the science and engineering students all take my philosophy religion course. So there it is. That's terrible. Okay. So first thing we have to be really thinking about aside is, why have we failed to teach people about science? And I think a lot of it has to do with we don't teach science as a humanistic subject. And what do I mean by that? You take an introductory science course, and before you knew it, you're working on equations. Equations are good things. Scientists do that sort of stuff all the time, right? Any scientists in the room, you probably write some equations on the board. But that doesn't get to the question of what do those scientific results say about the world and the human condition. So we have to transform science and education so that it becomes an education about us and the world and our place in the world. That's the first step. Having done that, which we'll get rid of in the next six months, we then have to turn to a, another set of problems. Central to most of those discussions are issues about risks and probabilities. And the bad news from cognitive psychology is that we mostly do very bad in thinking about risks and probabilities. And even statistics graduate students don't do that much better. OK. So you know, I can think about maybe better science education, but somehow our mind doesn't seem to handle these issues of likelihoods, probably. And that's what you have to be thinking about when you think about these questions. And I'm not sure, remember, the statistics graduate students didn't do much better on these tests. So I'm not sure, I don't know how to begin to deal with that question. But the third, and probably deepest of the problems, and now I must make really a very negative remark, is that we have a, today in America a society that doesn't take things seriously, that doesn't know what it means to think about serious issues. And if they're forced to do it, they hate it. I mean, and that, I, I could give you a whole speech about my evidence for that claim. But that's not, you just have to watch what's available tonight on television. Uh, so I'll leave it at that, OK? And people really resist being engaged in a serious civic dialogue. And that goes deeper than the question of what you know. And it's deeper of, it goes deeper than the question of, can you handle certain types of issues? Because our cognitive capacities aren't as good as they should be. That goes to the fundamental question of whether we as a citizenry and a body politic 
are prepared to understand that the world is a serious place and that there are real serious questions and they need to be seriously discussed. Uh, let me give an example. I'll give a bioethics example and then I'm going to shut up because I've been working too hard. Uh, but I'll tell jokes afterwards for those who want to hear some. Uh, you know, when I'm not going to get into the question of Obamacare, yes, but when all the discussion was going on about death panels, you remember that discussion? Here was what the real, the, here's what the issue was. The issue was, should doctors be reimbursed if they spend the time talking to you about your issues? So they don't just give you a form and say, fill it out and hand it in the next time. Okay. So the law was going to pay doctors, I think it was $82, something like that. It wasn't a lot of money, and that's a discussion that doesn't take, you know, you can't do that in five minutes. There was a concern. I mean, so in one sense, this looks crazy. Of course, if you want people to do something, you've got to pay them, capitalist society. Then there was a concern, that's a legitimate concern, that sometimes those discussions are biased in an anti-life way. And I have seen plenty of material that has been developed that has that bias built into it, including some material that was developed for the VA system. And that's a serious issue, a separate issue from the question of whether you should pay doctors that $80 for having those discussions. Those were two very legitimate questions that deserved an honest, real serious discussion. Do we want people to think about your questions? And how do we give them the information to think about them in a non-biased fashion? The last thing we got was a serious discussion about either of those questions. So I use that as my example to illustrate. If you feel frustrated about that, boy do I feel. You know, how do I tell my colleagues, take the half hour to talk to your patients when they won't get reimbursed at all? Thank you all very, very much for your attention.